Okay. Uh, okay, we're now live, uh, Mr. Oliver. Do you, do you want to switch back? Yeah, we do that now. Just hold on a second, David, before. Yeah, yeah. Going. I'm just. We have we have a few Canadians here. The ones that I know, anyway. Hi, Victor. Another one from Toronto. Really. Oh we've, got, oh, we've got all the Hudlins here. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. What can you do? Thanks, David. Okay, David, do you want to... Shall we begin? I think we're a couple of minutes into it. Yeah, take it away, David. Okay, hold on one second. I'll just switch my... Gee, um, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a very special evening. First of all, um, we've got another muzzle tough for David and Joy Lando on their 35th wedding anniversary, um, which is Coral. Thank Coral, you. Describe, yeah. um, if Joy's listening, David now knows that it is Coral. So um, muzzle tough to you both Thank um, you. for tomorrow. Okay. Um, tonight we have a very, very special person um, all the way from Toronto. Um, the, She's, I don't know how to introduce her. She's the amazing Judy Carr. Um, hi, Judy. <laughs> um, to, to start off with, I mean, you're, you're, when you're very young when you, when you got very involved in the rescue of Soviet Jews. Um, and I think you communicated with Sharansky. That was, that was I, I believe, your, your, the, sort of the first part of your, what you were doing. Um, you, um, after that... For 28 years, um, you not only got, in, got new, but you also lived, kept the best secret in the Jewish world. The Canadian musicologist and the mother of six supported her household and raised a family almost single handedly, and she rescued over 3,000 Syrian Jews. Um, I'm not going to go into that much now we can do all of that a bit later um but i, ha I have to tell you judy has received um, numerous awards including um one of the she was one of the first of six recipients of the presidential award of distinction of the state of israel the award was created by shimon perez in order to recognize outstanding contributions to the jewish people and the state of israel the israeli prime minister yitzhak rabin said very few people if 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 any have contributed as greatly as you have, obviously, Judy. Um, she also had the, the Order of Canada, which is the highest Canada um, that can give it to a citizen. Um, the, we, she had the, Jubilees, uh, the Queen's Jubilee Medal in 2002, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012, the Abram Slashen Medal as Woman of the Year, Brandeis University, the Saul Hayes Human Rights Award of Canadian Jewish Congress, the Simon Wiesenthal uh, Award for Tolerance, Justice and Human Rights, the, Haif, the University of Haifa Humanitarian Award of Merit, um, Women, Women of Achievement Award also of both Canadian Hadassah and B'nai Brit uh, women. Dr. Jane Evans, Pursuit of Justice Award of Reform, Judaism in North America, co-honoree of the Jewish National Fund, it nearly finishes, National Fund, Negev Dinner, uh, uh, Toronto, honoree of State of Israel Bonds, Toronto, co-honoree of the a Human Rights Award of the Canadian Centre for Diversity. She's received the honorary degree of Doctor, Law, Doctor of Laws for Laurentian University, the honorary degrees of Doctor of Humane Letters from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and there are others. And I, 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 I know I'm probably embarrassing Judy, but I really wanted you all to know what she's actually done and what she's received. Um, but I think I, I was told that the most important 
um, one for Judy, was an honor bestowed by Syrian Jewish leaders who recalled it was Judy Feld Carr who arose when it was still night and woke up in the, uh, to the world to the plight of our brethren in Syria. Perhaps we're now starting um, with a half hour film that will give you a complete insight into Judy's incredible life. After the film, Judy will be answering questions of which I'm sure there'll be plenty from the film. So please either write in the chat room or click in the participants box on the bottom right. But please don't wave your hands um, as we can't always see you. So sit back and I can't say enjoy, but please look carefully and, 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 and we'll see you in half an hour. So um, let's go. Yeah, just to just to say for those people who are who want to pose questions through the chat, um, I will be the only person who can see those. So if you have private messages for anybody, um, they will not get to that person. Uh, but if you wish to relay your questions through me, um, I'm happy to pass them on. Thank you. Are you pressing buttons? Phil, do you have it to hand? Uh, yes, I can do. Sorry, I didn't think I was, but I can. Yeah, one second. Thank you. A man from Damascus came to Toronto and left me his son and went back to Damascus. And the kid was crying in my backyard. He didn't know if he would see his son. A year later, he came back with another son and left me his son and went back to Syria because his wife and his other children were left behind. איך הצליחה אישה אחת במשך כמעט 30 שנה לסייע בהוצאתם של יותר משלושת אלפים יהודים מהמדינה העוינת ביותר לישראל? ג'ודי פלד קאר הפכה לארגון חשאי של אישה אחת. יהודייה מטורונטו, עקרת בית, אימא לשישה ילדים ומורה למוזיקה. הפעילה רשת של סוכנים מטעם עצמה כדי לחלץ יהודים מסוריה. אני יודע שהיא טוותה רשת של קשרים בסוריה. כיצד היא עשתה את זה, אינני יודע. מה שמחבר את ג'ודי עם גורלם של יהודי סוריה קורה בגלל ידיעה קטנה שמתפרסמת בג'רוזלם פוסט. ב-1972 ניסו 12 צעירים יהודים לברוח מסוריה. הם נהרגו בזה אחר זה. הסיפור מזעזע את ג'ודי, והיא מחפשת דרך לעזור לקהילה היהודית בסוריה. היא ובעלה הראשון פונים לשגרירות ישראל. תוצאותיה של מלחמת השחרור השפיעו השפעה דרמטית על מצבם של 30 אלף היהודים שנותרו בסוריה. התנכלות קשה הן מצד השלטונות, הן משכניהם הפלסטינים, 
ליוותה אותם לאורך כל השנים. יהודים היו נרדפים על ידי המוסלמים. היו רצים אחרינו, כשהיינו הולכים לבית הספר, רצים אחרינו, מיידים אבנים, מקללים, מגדפים, יהודים מלוכלכים, נבלות וכל מיני דברים כאלו. החיים בסוריה אה, היו חיים אה, של, של בעצם פחד מתמיד, שבעצם היה חשש. מתישהו, בכל, באיזושהי נקודה מסוימת, יכולים פתאום להציג לך. פתאום יכולים להתעלה, לקחת אותך ו, 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 ולהעלים אותך אפילו. יום אחד, באוגוסט 1974, הכינו סאלי קצב ובעלה זקי, הזמנות לחתונה של גיסתה, אווה ששון. פתאום שמענו דפיקה בדלת. בא אבא שלי, זכרונו לברכה, לפתוח את הדלת. ביקש ממני, בעלי אמר לו, לא דוד, תשב עד נפתח את הדלת. הלך לפתוח את הדלת, הוא פתח את הדלת, פתאום שמענו צעקה חזקה מאוד מאוד. ויצאנו ורצנו לצלון, אנו נו, ראינו אותו עושה כמה צעדים ונופל. אמרו לפתוח את הדלת, פתאום עוד לא פתח את הדלת, נתנו לו יריעה. הוא הגיע עד הסלון ואמר בערבית, הרגו אותי. זקי קצב נרצח לגמרי במקרה. הרוצח התערב עם חבר בבית קפה, שהוא יחסל את היהודי הראשון שיקרא בדרכו. ג'ודי מחליטה שאי אפשר לסמוך על המוסדות הרגילים, והיא יוצרת קשר עצמאי עם הקהילה היהודית. Who in Damascus? We don't know. Maybe it was, the whole thing was Meshuggah. What are we doing? We don't even know what we're doing. The operator in Damascus puts us through to a woman, a Jewish woman in Damascus. We found out she wasn't home, and again by shared. She wasn't home, but her husband was home. This woman worked for the Muhabarat, a Jewish woman who worked for the secret police. Her husband was home, and I swear we must have given this man a heart attack. He gave us the name of the rabbi, the name of the school, the phone number of the school, and the lines went dead. Judy Sholachat Mivrak, Lichtov et Arav shel Kielad Damesek. היא מבררת איך אפשר לעזור. A week later, the telegram company calls me up and says, I have a telegram for you from Damascus. Oh my God, I said, read it to me on the phone. And she reads it to me. The rabbi sent the first shopping list of books. We need the following books in Damascus. And he signed it. And that was the first contact into Syria since 1948. אח שלי רק הסתכל במשקפת, לקח משקפת והסתכל על הבוסדן, הוא יפה, כן? אז... מישהו ראה אותו שם כל הזמן, המוחה ברט, הסתובבו סביבה. אז הוא אמר לו, אתה מרגל, לקח אותו כמה ימים, אולי שבועות, לבית סוהר, ואינו אותו נורא. בזמן שהמשטר בסוריה רודף את היהודים, ג'ודי אוספת כספים מחבריה בקנדה. היא קונה ספרי קודש ושולחת אותם בדואר לסוריה. הקשר עם ג'ודי היה ב... למעשה דרך מכתבים. אבא לקח סיכון מאוד גדול בעצם במעשה הזה, כי ברור שמבחינת הסורים כל יצירת קשר חשאי עם מישהו מבחוץ זה פשוט סכנת מוות. I was only sending religious books. I wasn't thinking about getting people out. מה ששינה לגמרי את דרכה של ג'ודי, ובהמשך את חייה בכלל. הוא מכתב שכתבו שלושה רבנים מהעיר חלב. אזרחית קנדית שביקרה בסוריה מסרה לה אותו אישית.
ג'ודי שלחה מכתבים ליהודים נוספים בסוריה. אחד מהם היה משה ששון. המכתבים שעברו ביניהם היו מכתבים מוצפנים, שרק הוא והיא ידעו בעצם מה כתוב בהם. ומי שהיה קורא אותם מבחוץ, לא היה מבין על מה מדובר, הוא היה חושב שזה איזושהי סתם התכתבות בין חברים. If you would have told me in those days that I would ever, ever be doing this, I would tell you, you were totally off the wall. שמו אותי בסמנוק, מטר עד מטר וחצי, תחת אדמה והחושך. כל היום וכל הלילה, אני לא יודע, הלילה מהיום באמת, אלא הם יבואו ויגידו סבח אל חיר. יעני, בוקר טוב, אני אדע כי עכשיו בוקר. שלמה סווייד חי בפשטות בדמשק. הוא כבר היה נשוי ואבא לשבעה ילדים, עד שב-1984 הפך לגיבור של סיפור טרגי. מה שיקרה לו לימים יהיה אחת הסיבות שישפיעו על יחסו של חאפז אל-אסד ליהודים בסוריה. ב-1986, שלמה ושרה סווייד מדמשק מקבלים אישור יציאה לטיול באירופה. ילדיהם נשארים ערבון לחזרתם לסוריה. שלמה מסתכן ובא וחשאי לביקור בישראל. כאן הוא פוגש את שתי אחיותיו, שאותן לא ראה 40 שנה. כשהם נסעו בחזרה, אז הוא אמר, את יודעת, לא אכפת לי עכשיו למות. אני ראיתי את ירושלים וראיתי את, 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 את כולכם. אני אמרתי לו, אל תדבר, ככה יהיה בסדר, אולי יום אחד ניפגש. וחזרו והגיעו בשלום. חצי שנה אחר כך מגיע אלי סווייד, האח הצעיר ביותר במשפחה, גם הוא לבקר את אחותו, שברחה מסוריה הרבה לפני שנולד. אחרי הביקור בישראל, הוא יוצא לאיטליה כדי לקחת משם טיסה לדמשק. הגיע לאיטליה, נדברנו שהוא יתקשר אלינו. לא התקשר, התקשרנו אנחנו, אז הוא אמר שיש מישהו שהציע לו מלון קרוב בבית התעופה, למלון קוראים מורגנה, והוא החליט ללכת על זה. אז הוא היה שם, ואז כשהיה צריך לחזור... צלצלנו לו בשבת בבוקר, אמרו, אנחנו לא יודעים איפה הוא. הלך. המלון אמר, אנחנו לא יודעים, והרגשנו שזה שקר. לאה דואגת לאחיה אלי. היא מתקשרת לביטחון של שגרירות ישראל ברומא. אז כשאמרתי לביטחון, תשאלו על, על, על מלון מורגנה. אז הם צלצלו, אומרים, אין מלון, אין מורגנה, זה הכל פאטה מורגנה. אחיך, לא יודעים איפה הוא. שבועיים אחרי העלמו של אלי סווייד באיטליה, הוא הועלם גם אחיו שלמה. בסוף יום העבודה המתינו ליד בית המרקחת המשפחתי אנשי המודיעין הסורי ודרשו ממנו להיכנס לרכבם. במשך חצי שנה לאיש לא היה מושג לאן נעלם שלמה סווייד. הייתי בבית מרקחת, באו אליי ולקחו אותי שני מחברת סוריה תפסו אותי ונסעו אותי בווטסווגן. האחים סווד או עלמו, אל גורלם נשוב בהמשך. רבי דהב היה נשבעת מאוד 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 
having gum uh, cancer. And he was really very sick. He didn't have a long time to live. I found out that they weren't going to let him go without money. I had met a family already from Aleppo who came to Toronto to visit me. They told me everything about Aleppo, everything about the secret police, about the buying of people. Through them, I started to set up what was an underground to be able to transfer money into Syria to pay off for this rabbi to come out. The Syrians took the money and took the money of the rabbi. In 1978, he was in Canada. And he was killed in the hospital of Arsinai in Toronto. I went to see him and he said to me, Judy, I'm go the doctors knew he was going to die. He said, but I don't want to die here. Everybody's wonderful, but I want to die in Jerusalem. But I have a mother who's 97 years old. I haven't seen her since 1948. Do you think you could send me to Israel to see my mother before I have a cup of coffee with my mother? הרב אליהו דאב נקבר בתל אביב. כעבור שנה הוציאה ג'ודי מסוריה גם את בנותיו. אחת מהן חיה כיום בישראל. קהילות יהודיות בארצות הברית, כולם עסקו בנושא הזה, לכולם היו ועדות בנושא הזה, אבל אף אחד לא הרחיק לכת עד כדי טיפול אינדיבידואלי באנשים שרצו לצאת או רצו לברוח. האחים סווייד עוברים עינויים קשים בכלא הסורי. הם חקרו עם מי? היה החוקר דורסי, מהרה הדרוזים, טורקי על המדים, אחר כך ידעתי השם שלו. והיה אכזר, אכזר מאוד. שבו אותי מרגל לאותו ישראל. תגיד נדמה לי, אתה מכיר אלי כהן, אתה הכול. אתה מרגל, התחיל לתן לי מכות פה ופה ופה. חשמל גם, מכות, מכות חשמל ופלקות. They, they took out all the fillings from his teeth because they said, uh, the torture said, that if he, that fillings, he would be sending messages to Israel through those fillings. I Gestapo, Suri, Gestapo, SS of Germany. כמו הגסטאבו של גרמניה הוא היה, עד אכזר מאוד. אני השתדלתי להתאבד. ולקחתי השעון, והיה הבורחי שלה, עשיתי... נסוע פה וירד דם. לקחו אותי לבית, לבית החולים. הסורים לא אפשרו לשלמה להתאבד. כמעט חמש שנים היו אחים סווייד בצינוק בלי לראות אור יום. היה לי שבע ילדים, אני לא יודע מה המסוק שלהם. איפה הם? הם תפסו אותם גם? או אני רק, אני רק. הגיע לבית שלנו מכתב מקנדה, מן אחד קוראים לה ג'ודי. והיא אמרה לי, אני יודעת שיש לך בעיה, אנחנו איתכם ואנחנו נעזור לכם, אל תדאגו והכל יהיה בסדר. Nobody knew where they were. 
and she used to go from prison to prison to prison, taking her jewelry. I'll give you this jewelry if you let me see my husband and my brother-in-law. And they said, they're not here. We don't know anything about them. This went on and on. I met with the president of Amnesty International in Canada, and I said, um, you are doing nothing for Jews. You're doing for everybody else in this world, but I don't see Jews. I bought their book, and I read the book from cover to cover. I don't see one Jewish prisoner in this book. Why is that? Is it because they're Jews? What is this, uh, anti-Semitic? Oh, well, this is guilt, right? You tell me where those two men are. About six weeks later, I get a letter that the Syrians have told them where the two men are and that they're in prison. And I have the name of the prison. Four years after they were written and were written, they were written by the death of the king Suede in the jail. In the meantime, Judy is going to be another family. In 1980, Judy has the opportunity to make a family of Sasson. In the evening, all the family comes to Turkey. We wanted to see it. For a long time, we've been talking about it. Until we came back to the morning, on the 5th of the morning, my brother, שבר את ה... קודם כל את המנורה ברחוב, שנצא בלילה שאף אחד לא ירגיש. אני ואחותי ואימא שלי והאחיות שלי רווקות ואח שלי כולם ביחד. כדי להיות בטוחים שזו אינה מלכודת, הביאה משפחת ששון חצי שטר כסף, שהיה חייב להתאים לחצי השטר שבידי המבריח. כל הדרך ברגל. אני הייתי בהיריון בעיר החמישי, ולא סיפרתי למברך שלי בהיריון. אם הייתי אומרת לא, לא היה נותן לנו לצאת. וכל הדרך עלינו הרים, ירדנו, נפלנו, היה ממש פחד. וילדים קטנים, זה בוכה, ובעלי זכרון וחי היה נותן להם משהו שתהיה כמו שירדמו. למה המברך, הוא אמר לנו, מישהו בוכה. הבת של אחותי הייתה בת שנה. ‫התחילה <אז> באותו רגע שמעו רעש של ילדים בוכים, משהו כאילו מהילדים בוכים קטנים, רעבים, אז התחילו לירות. הפחד שלי על הילדים, מתחת לעץ, חביתי את כולם מתחת לעץ, היא בסדר מתחו לי ידיים ככה, שלא יקבלו איזה כדור. I didn't like to deal with smuggling at all. First of all, it was too dangerous, and what if they were caught? Um, I would pref my preference, and I can't say this was legal, because how is it legal to buy another human being? Legal, it's not. But it was easier to buy somebody or ransom somebody than to put somebody on an escape route, and what if they were caught? הגענו לגבול טורקיה, המבריח הרים לנו את, ה... את הגדר, וכולנו אחד אחרי שני, כולנו עברנו, והבת שלי מסכנה, הייתה ילדה קטנה, כל הרגל... הרגליים שלה נשרטו, דם ירד לה מהד... מהרגליים. זה היה ממש, זה משהו עד שהגענו. ג'ודי למעשה ליוותה את כל תהליך הבריחה, מההתחלה ועד הסוף, עד שמההתחלה, מבחירת המבריחים, ממהלך הבריחה עד ההגעה לטורקיה ועד להגעה ל- לישראל. נדמה לי שהילדותה גם חישלה אותה. כי מי שהיה באותו אזור יודע, בעיקר באותם ימים שבימי ילדותה, יודע שזה היה מקום קשה. 
לחיות בו ובעיקר לגדול בו כ- כילדה, ילדה צעירה. ג'ודי גדלה בערבות הקפואות של צפון אונטריו. אביה היה סוחר פרוות וצייד. מדי פעם בפעם היה לוקח את ביתו למסעות הציד שלו. כשבגרה ועזבה את הבית סיכם ברגע של כנות את מורשתו. מבצע החילוץ הקשה ביותר של ג'ודי נותר שחרור האחים סווייד, שישבו בצינוק הסורי. התחילו יותר לדבר עליהם, התחילו להופיע כל מיני כתבות כאלה קטנות בעיתונים. ארבע שנים מאז אותו הערב שבו נעלם בעלה, הותר לשרה ולבתם לבקר אותו בכלא. שרה לא מזהה את בעלה. הלכנו ככה, ואני לא ראיתי איפה בעלי. אני מסתכלת על זה, על פנים, ואני לא רואה איפה הוא. בת שלי, היא הסתכלה טוב טוב על איזה איש היה שם, ואמרה לי, אבא, אבא, הנה אבא. אמרתי לה, מה, מי זה אבא? זה אבא היה אחד עם זקן, ככה עם... השיער שלו לפה, וריח שלו, ריח מסריק, לא, לא יכולים ל, לראות אותו או ל, לדבר איתו. אמרתי לה, מה, זה אבא? אמרה לי, כן, כן, זה אבא. כדי להרגיע את הלחץ הבינלאומי, ערכו הסורי משפט זריז לאחים סווייד. תוך חמש דקות גמרו את המשפט עם גזר הדין, עם הכול. עוד חמש וחצי שנים בבית סוהר. אני קראתי את זה בעיתון. זה הופיע למחרת בעיתון. אני הייתי המומה לגמרי. יום אחד הגיע אליי ג'ודי למשרד והוציאה מתוך תיק שנשאה ספר תנ״ך. ואמרה לי, אתה הראשון שרואה אותו בקנדה. מיד ראיתי שהוא עתיק יומין. מרגש. עד היום הוא מרגש אותי, כן. התנ״ך, שנכתב בימי הביניים באיטליה, והגיע לדמשק, נחשב ליצירת מופת של אומנות יודאיקה. Only people did I pay for smuggling. This, nothing. Nothing. How I did it, it will never be known. This will not be the story of the only one that will not be known to the world. We will not know who the people who have been in the Soviet Union of Judy in Syria and how it will be the relationship between them. Let's say, a street in Damascus, Al-Amin Street. One person who lived near the church would think he was the only one who was working with me. A rabbi thought he was the only one who was working with me. Somebody else thought they're the only ones, so they never talked. They, because they, first of all, they were afraid to talk. Second of all, they didn't want anybody to know they were working with me. But you know what? 
בהתחלה הייתה מדינת ישראל חשדנית כלפי פעילותה של ג'ודי. הרעיון שיהודייה קנדית, אימא לשישה ילדים, מבריחה יהודי מסוריה לטורקיה נשמע כמו פנטזיה. לאחר זמן החל את ג'ודי והמוסד לשתף פעולה. לא עשו לה בעיות, אבל אני חושב שבתחילה זה היה מוזר להם, כמו שזה מוזר היה לך. שהיא עובדת לגמרי לבד, והיא עושה מה שהיא מחליטה, כן? ולכן היו קצת זהירים כלפיה. אבל הרגישו שהמידע שהיא מעבירה הוא מהימן, כן? ומועיל, וכך מעת לעת גם העבירו לה איזה עצה או מידע, אבל לעיתים די רחוקות, כי נזהרו איתה. The intelligence organization here had problems with me because, after all, I'm a housewife. I mean, so they thought. And, and I think it was very difficult for them to comprehend, to understand that I wasn't trained in foreign intrigue. משפחת נחום החליטה לברוח מסוריה. הוחלט שמשה ואחד מהילדים יצאו מהמדינה כחוק, כי אם ייתפס מישהו בבריחה, עדיף שזאת תהיה אישה. אותה יענו פחות בכלא. החלטנו שהוא, ברגע שהוא ייסע בבוקר, אני... יום אחד לא נשארת לבד עם הילדים בסוריה. פחדתי נורא. לקראת ליל הבריחה עומדת לפניהם החלטה גורלית. מי משני התאומים יסכן את חייו ויברח עם אימא? הגשנו בקשת אישור יציאה לשני, לתאומים שלנו, לא נתנו. נתנו לילד אחד. אז בחרנו, הילד היותר יותר חזק כביכול, ויותר קשור אליי, השארנו אותו איתי. ג'ודי <אז> שילמה את כל ההוצאות. אנחנו לא שילמנו למבריח שום דבר. אני שמתי רעה על הפנים, כי צריך להיראות כמו מוסלמית, ככה שלא יתעורר שום חשד. והתחלנו למעשה, עם רדת החשיכה, וזה בלילה בלי ירח, התחלנו את המסע. שם המסלול, הם כמו גששים, מכירים את נתיב הבריחה עד הגבול הטורקי. היינו אמורים כל פעם לקחת, אסור לנו לדבר בדרך. וזה חושך, חושך ואפלה, ואף אחד לא רואים מחצי מטר, לא ממטר אחד את השני. אני תפסתי את הידיים ש, של הילדים, וכל הזמן ילדים שאלו, מתי נגיע? ופחדתי לה, להגיד להם, לאן הולכים? שאלו, לאן אנחנו הולכים? אמרתי להם, לסבתא בדמשק, כדי שלא, שחלילה יתפסו אותנו, לא, יג, לא יגלו. ספרו שאנחנו הולכים לישראל. הגענו עד גדר טייל, וזה הקטע הכי, בהחלט, מכל הבריחה הכי חרוט בלב שלי, בלב ובזיכרון. היה גדר טייל, שזה המבריח הוריד אותו כדי שאנחנו נחצה, וזה בדיוק, פעם נזכרתי בניצולי שואה. ובדיוק הרגשתי גם שאני ניצולה. נסענו באוטו הזה עד שבדרך ראיתי, כבר התחלתי לראות שלטים כתוב בטורקית, רק אז האמנתי שסוריה מאחוריי ואנחנו אה, מתחילים עידן חדש בחיים שלנו, החדשים. I could sometimes buy two, and they had to give up their children to somebody they didn't know. And they didn't know. They never saw me. Nobody ever saw me. I was the best kept secret in the Jewish world. I decided I have to get them out of prison. And I told it to somebody in the Mossad that maybe I would get them out of prison. He said, you'll never be able to do it. They wouldn't have survived another two weeks, I'm telling you. 
another month, I don't think they could have survived. So what I decided to do was try to pay off everybody, the judges, the lawyers. As a lawyer, it's very difficult to come home one night and find your wife standing there. And as you come in, she says to me, Don, how do you bribe a judge? I said, I beg your pardon. He asked the lahas, lahas, mikol ha'olam. The Suede brothers were released from prison, and in the case of travel, all members of the Syrian Jewish community will now be accorded the same rights as those afforded to all other Syrian citizens. Yosh Korban, lekol dabar. Ani haiti Korban, lekol yehude Syria she alikhu. I got a call on my private line from Damascus, from the party that was taking place in the Damascus ghetto. And the Swedes came on the phone and said, thank you, Judy, thank you. They don't know very much English. Thank you, Judy. And I could hear the music. I could hear the singing. There was such a party in Damascus that night. משפחת סווייד עלתה לישראל שנתיים אחרי השחרור מהכלא. הם מתגוררים ברחוב אלי כהן בעיר בת ים. כבר יש להם תשעה נכדים. לשתיים מהן קוראים ג'ודי. Now what did you do? Oh my god, that's so beautiful. זה סילבר, סילבר. עדיין יש בעולם לפרות. המשפחה האחרונה שחילצה ג'ודי מסוריה הגיעה למערב במקרה מ-11 בספטמבר 2001, יום אסון מגדלי התאומים. סיפורה התפרסם כאשר הוא הוענק לאות מסדר קנדה, עיטור הכבוד הגבוה ביותר במדינה. אבל בישראל שמעו מעטים את סיפורה של עקרת הבית היהודייה, שלימדה מוזיקה קלאסית ביום, ובלילה חילצה אלפי יהודים. I didn't plan this. I had no plans 
actually, I had three children. My husband died a few months after I started the rescue. And uh, the Syrians tried to kill me and my children. And my husband died of a coronary the next day. So you should understand there's a lot of my neshama in here. The reason I have six children is later on I remarried. Uh, but if you would have told me, as I said in the film, there's no chance I was ever even thinking of taking people out of Syria. I've never been to Syria. I'm an Ashkenazi Canadian lady living here. The fact that I could figure out the system and could run escapes and ransoming, I stand back almost in awe when I realize what was done. I had no plans to do this. It just happened. You know, 20 years later, 28 years later, wasn't right. it? It was uh, that right, right at the very, very beginning of, of, of the film. Um, it showed you that you took one child in. Somebody turned up at the airport with one child. He then went back to Syria and brought another child back in. Um, and they came to Canada. And, and, and what, what, did, what did you do with them? I mean, they, they, they suddenly appeared with you. And I presume they weren't the only two. Um, what, and what happened to the kids? And, you know, where did they go? I understand. I have never been inside Syria. All, everything I did was on borders uh, in Lebanon and in Turkey and in North America, in Europe, is how I was running this thing. Um, I didn't take children, but you have to understand how the children were coming. People in Syria would hear there was a lady in Canada and it's hard to even visualize since the Shoah. But they heard a name called Mrs. Judy. They had no idea where I was living. And they had to find a way to get their children out. They found so many different ways. Uh, they would go for a day to Cairo and come back and phone their relatives in, the, in Brooklyn or phone Israel and say, how do I get her? How do I find her? Will she take my family? Will she take my children? Because I never made the initiative to take anyone out of the country. They had to find me first. And that was very, very hard considering they had no idea of my last name. They didn't know where I was living. All they knew was a name. And if they got the report that the name Judy is involved, then they felt a certain amount of confidence. But really, even to this day, so many people, they ask, how, who is she and how did she get me? And it, I know it sounds rather ludicrous, but the system was so, so secret because I ran it. And so I never told anybody how I was doing it. But uh, presumably your family must have known what was going on. Oh, my children knew. Uh, they knew there used to be a joke in our house. Oh, she's leaving. We used to have a big freezer in our basement in our home. And they used to say, oh, She's cooking brisket. She's making chicken. Look how much she's making. She's going again. But they never asked, not one of my kids ever asked me where I was going, when I was coming home. And they knew there was a certain place where they did not question. I made like this rescue was part of their life. Not a big deal. Mother's going away for a few days. I'll be back. I used to call around six o'clock Toronto time and make sure that they ate dinner. Did you eat your asparagus? Stop fighting with him. Leave her alone. 
the usual things mummies do with the kids. My mother always thought that I was going to a spa. And when I would come back from this so-called spa, she'd say, how come you look so tired? How come you look so awful? And I'd say, well, mother, if you were raising six kids, you would be tired too. I had to go away for a few days. She didn't know I was in Beirut. She didn't know I was in Istanbul or at Skanderun, but uh, I had to make it a very natural part of the lifestyle. It's a funny thing. One of our son's friends uh, later on in life said to me, you know, we used to call your house the embassy because there were so many kids and our kids all went to Hebrew day schools. So they had all kinds of friends over. The house was a balagan. And they knew that there was lots of food and they could get something to eat. But he said to me, we called it the embassy because we knew that when that door closed upstairs, none of us could ever say anything, talk, tell our parents, and nobody talked. These kids never talked. It was quite, quite astounding. Nobody ever spoke about it. Mm. And the rescue went on, and I raised the money by word of mouth. Judy, could I jump in? Uh, just how did you find um, juggling life and uh, separating the, um, the different parts of your life? Was it a struggle for you? I, life the whole time that I was doing this was a struggle. Uh, I'm making it simplistic, but I have to tell you, I lived with the most incredible fear day and night. I left, I was a professor of musicology at three universities, nothing to do with Syria. I taught in one university, the mass of the Catholic Church of the 14th century, at Yeshiva University, I taught Jewish music at Hebrew U, I taught uh, uh, Yemenite Jewish lullabies, I taught research in musicology. And this is alien to anything that I was doing. But when the rescue started actual the rescue with the people. I dumped my career. I left the univer I left the University of Toronto. Everything went by the wayside. This literally, literally took over my life. Because when you're dealing with people that you don't know and they're going out on an escape route. And what if I make a mistake? What if the smuggler is a double agent of the secret police? I would lose somebody's life. You're living with that dread, that fear of that. I'm also living with security issues. So I'm being put together, pushed together on this in the middle. And I also have children to worry about that nothing happens to my kids. So yeah, it was as stressful and as difficult as you as could be. But when I was home, which was a lot of the time, life was normal. I did all the cooking. I, uh, I went, I missed a few school, uh, uh, teachers' meetings, which I was not forgiven for, because I have kids who know how to do a guilt. And uh, how come uh, my mother couldn't come to the parent-teachers' meeting? Well, your father went. I had to be away. But um, I did make life as normal as is humanly possible, really. Yeah, I'd go to the hairdresser, cook Shabbat dinner. We'd have 
friends over in the days before COVID, and you could have people, and um, and life was as normal as it could be. But then I'd have to leave for a few days at a time. Have you, found, your, have you found yourself looking over your shoulder? Oh, well, many, many times. Do you still do that now? No, I only had, um, surprising to me, like I think the Syrians have a lot on their plate. Like they've killed a half a million people in their country. It was the 10th anniversary of the war, I think, yesterday. That's so. right. <laughs> they, I mean, they... They've got enough troubles. <laughs> I, I, would th I would think so because their country is, is divided into different terrorist groups. Uh, Assad only controls Damascus, but the um, now I've I've uh, gone off and I've forgotten. Will you go back to your question? You do you still look over your shoulder? Uh... Yes, that's what I was going to tell you. I haven't had a threat for a long time, but when Ellie Cohn's yard site came last year, uh, you know Ellie Cohn was the great spy of Israel. When his yard site came, the Syrian newspaper in Arabic had a picture of Ellie Cohn on the front page. And uh, the headline was, Two Jewish spies in, Israel, in Syria. And they had the picture of Eli Cohn as it, he was, the, heli, the picture of Eli Cohn with the noose around his neck hanging, and next to him was my picture. And it said, Eli Cohn is dead, she's still alive. That was a very worrisome thing because it made the front page of the Syrian uh, national newspaper. And I don't know why it suddenly came about now, but it's been quiet since that, uh, since that article. That was very disconcerting, I can tell you. Good. Because what, what they use, there's a book that's written in Canada by a professor of history, the best, uh, one of the most important professors of history at the University of Toronto. And the book is called The Rescuer. And the cover of the book is that. That's the picture that they use. So the Syrians had the book. So it shows you how well done the, how really well done their uh, intelligence uh, goes. Yeah. The, the, uh, you've obviously achieved a great deal through the years. I was just wondering and whether these three all mold into one, which is your greatest achievement over that period, the most pride that you have and the abiding memory from that. And is there anything in particular that, fits into those? Well, of course, as I told you, fear was a major, major part of my life. I have to tell you, uh, there were several attempts on my life, three in particular, and uh, uh, they were very, very worrisome. I... I became a big actress, a very good actress. I was an actress at home. I was an actress with my parents. I, the only one who really knew what was happening was my husband, but he didn't know. He, I couldn't tell him what I was really doing and I couldn't tell him about the lives I was dealing with. So I'm living such an insane life. The probably one of the most wonderful things that happened, I guess, to answer part of your last question, is that Syrian Jews started naming their babies Judy. And 
you heard the Swedes did. The chief rabbi of Syria has a Judy. Um, Judy is not a name that's a, a name that Syrian Jews named their kids. But now there's Judy's all over the place. There's Judy's in Mexico. There's Judy's in in Brooklyn. There's Judy's in in Israel. And nobody in the next generation knows where the name came from because they Sephardim always name after the living. And to me, this this is probably the greatest honor I ever got. <laughs> is every time there's a Judy and I and I don't know them all, but I have pictures on my shelf here of some of the Judies as they send me pictures. I have an I frame another Judy or put it in an album. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, it's a Nashkenazi. I'm not going to know if any of my kids ever named their kids after me. So there you go. Yeah. The, um, uh, you, you, you mentioned before um, that you were in Lebanon a couple of times and you, we've seen you in Israel. Did you ever get into Syria? No, I never, I want, never wanted to. The Canadian government told me they had no idea what I was doing. I would go to have meetings with the foreign ministry in Ottawa on human rights. How can Canada have, well, they didn't have an embassy in the early days in Syria. The embassy was in Beirut and then in, in Amman. But I would go to them and say, how can you not do this on helping uh, the human rights of my people in Syria. They used to, one of them called me even an agent of the Israeli government. Was I part of the Israeli government? And I lost it in his office. And I said, how dare you? I'm born in Montreal. I grew up in Sudbury. I live in Toronto. How dare you tell, uh, accuse me? of being an Israeli official. I'm doing this as a Canadian person who is worried about the human rights of my people. And, um, and then after that, I never walked out of an office in Ottawa with a no. I got maybe, I got okay, we will, but I never walked out with a no. I would sit there in, in the foreign ministry until I got at least close to the answer that I wanted in terms of the human rights. But look, this, the, the Canadian government really did not know what I was doing on the side. I was, I'm just a nice little lady dealing with human rights but representing the Canadian Jewish community through Canadian Jewish Congress at the time. I, I, uh, Flora Frank wanted to have a, a question. Really? Flora? No, Victor Huglin is asking a question, which is, why do you think your story is not well known in Israel? Um, I think the first time my story was even thought about was when this uh, Israel Broadcasting did that film that you just saw. And that was shown on Israel TV several times. And when I got the honor of, uh, from um, the president, uh, Paris, and it was on television, there was Kissinger got it, Clinton got it, Zubin Mehta got it, Elie Wiesel got it, I got it, Rabbi Stein's all in the first six. And, um, and people are saying, who's she? Who's she? But you know what? That's perfectly fine. In Israel, they didn't have to know. Because you know, and I think all of us sitting on here know, are there any secrets in Israel? I tell you, somebody, I swear, if they go to the washroom, the whole country knows. And I have an apartment in Israel. I have kids who live in Israel. I have grandchildren in the army uh, in Israel. There's no secrets in that country. 
That's why I never told anybody. I didn't need the kavod. I didn't need the yichus of having it uh, uh, shown all over. Because I can tell you, if it was public, I couldn't have done this. It couldn't have happened. Israel is Syria's worst enemy. So if I ever went public and talked about this, the whole thing would have been over. And if they don't know in Israel, what can I tell you? I did mean, you have, if they turn out the movie, they'll find it. Did you bring any non-Jews out of Syria knowingly or who posed as being Jewish that you wouldn't necessarily have known but found out later? No, I, I never took any non-Jews out. Uh, every, I, I had enough trouble trying to get Jews out. <laughs> Um, and I never, uh, I was only, I was only doing Jews. Period. I only asked that because when the Russian borders opened, a number of Russians who were non-Jewish managed to say they were Jewish and they got to Israel. Um, That's true. But don't forget the whole world was every country, every government practically, uh, every Jewish community was dealing with Russian Jewry. There wasn't anybody that was dealing in Syria. Yeah. And so that that couldn't have happened. Okay. Yeah, I only, I am really concentrated. Uh, it, you see, you have to understand that People were contacting me through relatives in Brooklyn or wherever. And, and, and I even got contacts through the president of Israel, Mr. Navon. Uh, I'll give you one example. A soldier came into, uh, just one example, because there's so many. Um, only in Israel could a soldier get an appointment with the president of a country, right? And so one of the soldiers who was in the Air Force came to Mr. Navon and said, if anybody finds out that I'm in Syria, I have family left in, in Aleppo. They're going to kill them. Uh, you have to help me get my family out. So who do you think his secretary calls? Me. And then it started where I took part of the family out on ransom and I did the escape of the mother and four kids after I got the father out who was not well and the brother who had been beaten up in prison that's when I did the escape of the mother and the four kids and that escape was done the day of my father's funeral so we uh, the rabbi had to postpone my father's funeral by an hour on Yom Hatzmaut because I had to get all the money together to run that escape that that morning. So you can see it, it was a very, um, it took my life over. It really did. It is um, Flora, somewhere she wanted to ask a question. Um, I can if she'd like to raise her hand, then I can. She's not. She's on the other sheet. No. Am I on mute? Oh, here she goes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, I, Judy, I, 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 I'm just. I don't like to use the word God, whatever it is, but you're a real Gibor, a real heroine. I wrote it on the chat. You're an amazing lady, and you're obviously very, very modest. And um, I have two very short questions for you. I still don't understand. You did this in such a modest, unassuming, humble way. How did it all come out? I don't understand it. I listened very carefully. And I, so please forgive the question. But, you know, you said in Israel there are no secrets, but you did everything very secretively. So how did it all come out and when did it all come out? And how did you get that vast amount of money from people? That's another feat. You're not only just doing such an amazing work, but you're getting, you're, you're having to raise lots and vast and vast sums. Now, obviously, there may be things you don't want to say, so perhaps there's no, no, a reason. I, I don't, thank you very much, Flora. It's nice to meet you. But may I just say, may Hashem bless you. I want to say that. I, I, he should bless you with a long life to 120 years and your whole family, because you're amazing. Inshallah. 
Alavai. Alavai. When did it come out? It started, Mr. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Miss, uh, Mr. Rabin, made it public too early. Uh, he, he commented, I had met him once very, very briefly, it was a nothing meeting. He invited me to his office and he said, uh, Will you hurry up and finish this because we have to negotiate uh, with Syria and the Golan Heights or something to that effect. I won't go into that two minute meeting in his office. But what he did is he made it a little bit public and he shouldn't have because it was in passing, but I heard it and the ambassador brought me a letter from him, which I have, which is a lot of uh, compliments and whatever, but I didn't need the compliments right now because I, I was dealing at that time very, very, um, uh, it was very hard in Kamishli to get the Jews out and, in, and at that time in Aleppo. And so, uh, I was doing the escapes from Kamishli and out of the country, and it was not a good time for him to have said it. And then it was, then it stopped. So it really didn't come out, I think, until the movie came out. And that was shown, that movie that you saw that uh, Israel Broadcasting did on the Channel One at the time. And it was part of the news, the Mabat Sheni program. It was going to be a 10-minute uh, interview at the end of the news. But then the, um, the uh, producer said, oh, we can't do it in 10 minutes. And then Israel Broadcasting paid for it. It was shown several times on Israel TV, but I'm and then really forgotten. So in Israel, they have no idea, except the people who were in the Mossad at the time, certainly. We worked in direct, well, together in certain ways. They gave me protection at different times. The money. There's the biggest synagogue in North America is in Toronto called the Beth Sedek Congregation. It's a congregation of around 8,500 people. And that, we, my, my late husband and I were members. I'm still a member, I'm with my husband now. But I, eventually, I became the first woman president of Beth Sedek, uh, where women could not tread. It's a conservative shul, not British conservative, Canadian conservative, which is between orthodoxy and reform. In that, when my late husband died, I was 33. The Board of Governors at the time knew that I was sending, we had started sending in the first two boxes of religious books into Syria. And they said, we'd like to start a fund in memory of your late husband, Dr. Ronald Feld Fund for Jews and Arab lands. And people give donations for $5, $10, like you would buy you know, trees for JNF or something, and they give donations, and then you'll have enough money to send these boxes when the rabbis were asking. Because remember, those boxes were very, very important because they were the outlet. I was getting all the information from the rabbis and coded telegrams, and I was sending little messages in these books. And... Um, that the rabbis were asking for. Well, what happened is the word got across the country from Vancouver to Newfoundland about this 
Shul sending in religious books and people started giving donations. Then in 1977, I got my first person out. And this was now costing big time because the money that had to come in to buy people was astronomical and escapes were costing a fortune. So what I did is I had a little group, a few friends that were involved in Canadian Jewish Congress and we were calling the rabbis across the country to tell the rabbis that something's going on in Syria, we need help, but we can't tell you what it, what it is. Well, you put two and two together, but I have to tell you, it was like a miracle. No ads, no dinners, no cocktail parties, nothing. It was by word of mouth across from Newfoundland to Victoria. Money was coming in all the times. I would have some speakers go out and talk about human rights in Syria and in the Arab countries, and they had to give an honorarium, a large honorarium. We put it all into the fund, and that's how we paid. And I have to tell you, it was costing in the millions of dollars. I never took a cent from the UJA United Jewish, uh, United Israel Appeal, or any major organization in the Jewish community. This was all done by individuals. And the reason I didn't is because what if I was going to do a ransoming of, of a part of a family and it didn't go through and I lost the money? or if there was an escape that didn't happen. I'd have to go to a board of governors and I'd have to tell the board, well, I'm sorry, you gave me $10,000 and I couldn't, and it didn't work. Do you know, you can well imagine all of you sit on the board of a shul or anything else, what would have happened if the money was lost, if I had to report? Well, I never lost but I never reported. And that was why it was successful. Nobody really knew what I was doing with it. But I, it was all, all the money was accounted for in the Beth Sedic. But we used to say we're buying books, we're buying, we did. We buy, buy Talesim, Tvilin, every kid in Syria had, every bar mitzvah kid had a Talit and a, and a, uh, and a set of tefillin, and we were sending mezuzot, all kinds of things that they asked for. But we were also running a rescue. Was it just, were you just able to raise the money in Canada, or did other countries become involved, or Jews from other countries? I got, uh, uh, the interesting thing was the executive director of Betsetic went to a meeting in Baltimore of executive directors in the United States of different shuls. And one of the directors of the Beth Tefilo congregation in Baltimore, Maryland said, you know, it's an Orthodox shul. We would like to get involved in this. Well, to me, this was a godsend. Why? It was US dollars. Canadian money is, is like 40, 35% less than the US dollar and the Syrians only took American money. Uh, so when the Beth Tefilo got involved, they were sending me, they had the fund of the same name, the Dr. Ronald Feld Fund, Again, it was, they would tell their congregation and other congregations, the money is being used to send religious books into Syria, not ransom. And the money was coming. We were bringing in American dollars. We're coming to, to Canada. They would give the tax receipt and we would get the checks. 
And this was wonderful. It was for me, it was like if in Yiddish, give one the geld, because here I had US dollars coming in. But what I did is when I would get a family out or an escape, I always asked for, uh, not I couldn't always get it, but I would get pictures and I would send it to the person who paid that huge amount of money and say, this is the mitzvah you did. Here's the girl. She's 19. Put it away. Show it to your grandchildren. So you know you saved somebody's life. But, okay. but other than that, no publicity whatsoever. Okay. So that's why today when you see me, you I mean, none of you ever heard of me today, and that's fine. But not up, and, up until now. Hopefully, hopefully we'll make you famous over here. <laughs> can, can, can I go back, can I go back to, to, to Syria? Um, I read something about that the, there was a, a barbaric murder of four Syrian Jewish girls, um, three sisters and a cousin. They tried to escape but got caught. They were raped, mutilated and murdered. How difficult was it for Jews to, to really leave Syria if they wanted to, which I thought most, most of them wanted to? Those girls tried to escape in 1974 and they, they actually escaped with two men, two young Jewish men, and uh, they, they were murdered and raped, and their bodies were brought back into the Damascus ghetto, and they were dumped in, their, in front of their parents' houses in burlap bags on uh, the Shabbat before Purim, Shabbat Sahor. Ironically, Shabbat Zahor, the Shabbat of Remembrance. Uh, this was a horror that was indescribable. And people who were in Damascus at the time have never, ever forgotten it. Um, I got out the, the only surviving brother of the uh, Zebach sisters. He died a few years ago. The parents died in Syria. And Eva Sa'ad's um, family also died in Syria. She was the only child. It was, it was a horror. It was a horror. But then again, in Aleppo, a man came home, this I'm talking now in the 80s. A man gets a phone call at home. A man named Victor Abadi gets a phone call at home. Go home. Uh, he's at work. He said, they say to him, go home and see what happened to your children. He walks into his house. They hacked his wife to pieces with an ax. They killed his two children with an ax. And they cut the fetus out of her body with an axe. She was six months pregnant. Now, this happened in 1984. I eventually got out her sister who was threatened. She lived next door and she had three kids. It cost me, and I'm telling you bluntly, I didn't have the money. It was a straight ransom of of her sister, her husband, and three kids, and it cost 250,000 US dollars. I, what we did is we called every rabbi we could get our hands on across Canada with one thing, we need money. And that was it. And do you know that I had double the amount of money that I needed? It was just before Shabbat Zahor, we had I had double the amount of money. If you would have seen my house, the shuls were dropping off from their, from their own finances. They were dropping off checks 
I had every Purim carnival. My kids were sitting on the floor rolling quarters and nickels. That was the kind of money that was coming in. Now, I tell you, we bought that family. There was no choice because they would have killed them. There's no doubt they would have killed them next. And this was the sister who lived next door. That was the kind of thing that you had to deal with and you had to deal with it fast because if a Syrian says they're gonna kill you, believe it, that's exactly what they're going to do. And, and presumably there are no, no more murderers in, uh, uh, coming to task. I'm because sorry? It didn't exist. No, I suppose the murderers, and there were many of them obviously, um, I say they never get caught, but I suppose they were the police anyway. Nobody has ever been charged with killing a Jew. Nobody. You saw in the movie about the man who opened the door and it was the bar mitzvah time of his kid and he opened the door and an Arab shot him in the head. No one has ever been charged with killing a Jew. Not ever. Not ever. But the, the, the Jews that did escape or got through with, with over 30 years nearly, um, where did they go? How did they know where to go? Well, they, you know, they lived, presumably, most of them lived in Syria all their lives. So they, they came through Turkey, I believe, most of them. And then what? What happened to them? The only ones who came through Turkey and Lebanon were through an escape. The ransoming of the people um when when i paid ransoms for the people which is horrible to say because people were i mean they were bought you know the you know how horrible it is to buy another person to buy a human being i would i would negotiate prices um i didn't do it directly i always had somebody doing it for me inside Syria. I always had uh, agents in my underground negotiating. I never negotiated inside in with the with the secret police ever. And um, and I would say they would say they want five thousand dollars for this girl. I would say I'd send a message back through my underground. I don't pay $5,000 for her. Um, 1,000, because she's fat and she's lost her teeth. Now, is this not disgusting? I mean, it is so disgusting. If I had to do this about my own child, I'd die first. Then they would negotiate, no, we'd want four. Then I would say, no, 2,000. Then we get to 2,500. Like you're buying cattle. I was buying people like you're buying cattle. And uh, those people that were ransomed would come out on American visas. A few kids, Canada was next to impossible depending on the government, if it was a conservative government, I got some kids in here, uh, some teenagers. Uh, with the liberal governments, I couldn't get anybody in. And uh, the others would go uh, on an American visa into the United States. But in order to get the Syrian passport to get a Syrian passport to leave the country, I paid for that. I paid to stamp the passport that they could say exit valid for only the United States. And they would give them a temporary passport valid for six months or one year. Well, and a return airline ticket. I had to pay return airline tickets. So if anybody you know once I have here in one of my filing cabinets, I saved about 50 return airline tickets to Damascus. Um, the rest I told the people, keep your tickets and frame it and show it to your children and your grandchildren one day how you came out. But that's how it worked. 
the Syrians wanted the return tickets because they would cash it in and they were making money, extra money on the return tickets. But I have a bunch of them here that I kept. Uh, we have a question from um, Gerald, who is it? Gerald Barnett, if you'd like to unmute yourself. No. Yeah, I can see him. Can you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see him. He's not unmuting himself. Would you like to unmute yourself? How to do it. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Hello. Good oh. evening. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. How, how, many how many children, how many people did you rescue? Three, according to the Mossad, 3,228 people. Wonderful. They counted. They counted. <laughs> I just have all the files and little pieces of paper, but they counted. Thank you so much. But now they have children, grandchildren. Some of them are great grandparents. So there's a lot of people now out of those 3,000. They have big families. You're one. No, I'm, no, it's gone. Oh, it's gone. Uh, you, 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 uh, okay. I think it's getting. It's getting. Are there any other questions there? So I, I, I just want to ask you a question um, um, about the life in 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 Syria. Um, they must. Have, I mean, they must have had very difficult times. In, 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 especially in the seventies and so on, because um, I, I think when 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 Israel won the sixty seven and uh, sixty seven and seventy three wars, um, the Arabs went completely berserk about the Israelis because they you know they suddenly became top top dogs, which the Arabs really didn't like, and I think that's a lot of the problems that that that, um, that they gave obviously the Syrians, but they're they're, they're about. I think they said in your film there's something like 30, 30 to 35,000 Jews. Um, I, I assume most of them are in um, Damascus and Aleppo, weren't they? But I mean, 35,000 is a, a fair amount. But did, did they have shawls and did they have kosher food and they, could they live like Jews? Yeah, it's, it, that's interesting. In the 40s, there were 40,000 Jews in Syria. Um, many of them, before the 50s, well, it was terrible in 48 because that's when they burned the synagogues and they burned the uh, the great Aleppo Keter that's in the Israel Museum now. I took out the Damascus Keter, but the other one was the Aleppo Keter, uh, the crown of, of Aleppo, uh, it's called. It's the whole Tanakh. Um, Every war brought worse problems. In 67, in just as an example, in Kamishli, they had to paint their doors red so that everybody would know who were the Jews. Um, Jews were watched. You see, the reason uh, these escapes had to go through was because Jews were watched all the time. Um, anybody from the Muhabarat, and not just during the wars, the wars were horrible. I mean, Yom Kippur was terrible. The uh, 67 war, they, they were arresting people left and right and putting them in prison for no reason and uh, making life horrible for them. The secret police sat in the shuls to watch that they didn't uh, send a message to Israel. They, but interesting, the shuls were still open right until the end. They allowed them to pray in the shuls. There's something about that. They allowed them to be buried in the Jewish cemetery, but they put a highway through the cemetery. So the high, you know, the cemetery shriveled because it was a highway through the middle of the graves. 
uh, they had a lot of restrictions. They couldn't sell their property. The Jews who got out, do you know there's a tremendous amount of property in each of the three cities that are Jewish-owned property that they can't sell. They couldn't sell. They couldn't sell their stores. When they walked out of that, on that escape route, they took nothing. They took my part. I mean, the Mossad ran the escapes too, my escapes, they took nothing but a change of underwear and a change of socks, nothing else, or a diaper for the baby, nothing else. So they left everything behind. So the Syrians absconded with everything. All the Jewish homes are still there. And um, the Jewish businesses are there. They had to have a, Jew, uh, a Muslim partner. So the partner took over the business. And um, so it was a horrible situation to live in because every time there was an attack against Syria from Israel, they took it out on the Jewish community. They had hostages in three ghettos. Now, let's say if you lived in Damascus and you want to go to Aleppo because your sister lives there and you want to go to the wedding, up until 1978, you could not go between the cities. After 78, you, went, you were allowed to go to the secret police, give them a present, give them some money and say, I'm going to go to Aleppo. Can I go to this wedding? I'll be back tomorrow night. You paid off, you went to Aleppo. Never mind that you couldn't leave the country. You couldn't even go to between the three cities. Now, if a Jew wanted to live in Hama or live in Latakia, don't think it. You can't go to those cities. You are in three ghettos and that's where you're staying. And you live in that area. You can't live in another part of Damascus. You live in the Jewish quarter. And that's the way it was right until the end. But then they were allowed to travel to Aleppo or to Damascus, but they paid for it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, think, I think we've broken all records. I mean, we can carry on if you want to. I don't know if there's anybody got, got other. I'm, Morris, I've got Morris has got a great uh, a raised hand. I'm not sure which Morris. Well, it is. depends how long you want to continue for. Well, I could carry on. Until three hey, listen, I can't go anywhere. <laughs> we're four hours ahead of you. <laughs> You're on till midnight. We're on till four in the morning. Okay. No, no, no. It's not that. It's about 20 to six. Yeah. It's so it's we're okay. okay. I'll bring Morris in. Morris, if you'd like to there's unmute two, yourself. Two, you've got two raised hands, apparently, as well. Yeah. Okay. Morris, I'm trying to unmute you, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Unmute. That's Hello. me? Oh, yeah. Morris. Yeah. Um, right, yes. Um, yes, Judy, thank you very much for the most interesting disposition that you've given us. Could you please tell us, if you had never been, never been to Syria, how did you manage to get, obtain agents to act on your behalf? Obtain agents, people to work on your behalf? Oh, I, I set up an underground inside Syria in 1974. I, somebody, I'll tell you how it's actually started. An older couple, older, I was young then, they were older, uh, was allowed to go to New York, as long as they left their whole family behind. And they wanted to come to Canada to meet me because they had seen, they were living in Damascus and they had seen the books that were coming into the shuls. And inside each book, it said in French, because French is a second language, Best wishes to the Jewish community of Damascus, Syria, from the Jewish community of Toronto, Canada. So the people saw, would open the Siddur and see this on the inside page. 
no, I cut the I cut the bindings. Anything printed in Israel was cut out, but the inside page had this handwriting. So they came to Brooklyn, and and I knew somebody in the in the foreign ministry who let them come into Canada without stamping their passport. And they spent a day with me, and we worked out how they could set up for me uh, a group of people in an underground. Well, this expanded more and more and more because some people were allowed into New York if they left their family behind and uh, they would come to Brooklyn. I would go to Brooklyn. We would work out a situation so that I had people in Damascus, Aleppo, and 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 Damas uh, and Kamishli who were already part of my underground. And so the underground got so phenomenal that I could tell you when Assad left home and where he was going. I could find out things within eight hours of anything happening. And this was a real Jewish underground. I have to tell you, I did have a few non-Jews who were Christians that I was also paying off because they had kids who were in McGill University and at the University of Toronto. So these parents couldn't get the money out to their children. And I worked out a system for them to get money out under the condition that I need something. And I could get everything that I wanted without, I never made another phone call after the first one in 1973. There was never another phone call except when the Sweds called on that private line. Um, and there were no letters. The only letters that went into Syria were ones that I wanted open. I knew the, the secret police would open the letters. They were all coded and I wanted them to see. I even put uh, bank drafts into the letters that would go to, let's say to Mrs. Sweat when, or one of the other prisoners' wives who didn't have any money, I would put in a bank draft in US dollars, knowing that the secret police was gonna open that letter. I wanted them to see, and then I would get a letter back and the Jews, you wouldn't believe this, they were picking up my codes. One. In Damascus, if they heard the word gin, I used to drink gin, now I'm into vodka, they knew gin, that's me. Uh, the rabbi knew Chinese food uh, because he came to Toronto once and my husband uh, used to be a gourmet Chinese cook besides being a lawyer. He's a cook. He used to cook a lot. And the rabbi never saw a man in the kitchen cooking. We had a code of how many thousands of egg rolls uh, we were sending. How many thousands of chicken wings were going. Uh, that's dollars. I had codes going on with different people. If they heard the code, they knew it was me and nobody knew what the code was with individual people. The next door neighbor didn't know the code. Um, everybody had a code. I used to keep a list of who I'm dealing with, with the codes. So if they heard that code, they knew it's coming from me. And that's how it worked. It was a great underground system. I can't even tell you how good it worked. It was a brilliant underground system. And then they would, uh, they would be able to contact their relatives in the Syrian community in Brooklyn. And the relative would call me and tell me, 
I have something to tell you, Mrs. Judy. Maybe you know what this means. I hear it. Great. I'm ready for the, the, the escape. I, I was running the escapes with, I think you saw the piece of, of, a, of a Syrian lira that was torn. Well, they would also get pieces of jewelry that were broken. And that was, the smuggler had the other piece of the jewelry. They had one piece. That meant get out this minute. You got the second piece, you're out. You've got five minutes, get out of the house. Leave your pots on the stove and goodbye, you're going. And that's how things had to be working. It was a lot of tension there, you know. <laughs> That's the understatement of the lifetime, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, look, it uh, that underground, that underground work, do you know? And um, I, I guess it's a year ago, December, I, my husband and I went to a Syrian wedding in New York. Uh, just, I never used to go to them, but this one, this family is like one of the rare families that I keep in touch with. I don't keep in touch with anybody I got out of Syria, except the prisoners, because uh, I got everybody out of prison. And um, this one family, when I went there, I, I don't know the people. I've never seen them. And people are coming over to me. Mrs. Judy, um, uh, and they would tell me the word. I said, oh my God, you're from Aleppo. This is now wonderful. That I, I, know you're, I know the code with you, Mrs. Judy. This is my code. And this, and this is the first time I've seen them was a year ago, December. And then of course, everything closed up for COVID. So I never went back again. Oh. He's, he seemed to be very friendly with the um, the couple in, in Cholom when you saw them in the film. It, it, there was a couple in in Cholom that you in in the film, and he he was he was um, I can't remember his name. He was a chemist that was taken in for five years, wasn't he? Uh, he was you're tortured. talking. Uh, well, those people that 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 the um, that the producers chose. Yeah. I didn't give them names. They they found them in Israel. Uh, there are some of the people, some people in Israel that I did keep in touch with. I told you the prisoners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and now um, a few of them have died since. Uh, Selim Swed died last year. The one that's on there, his brother is alive. He's a pharmacist in in Bat Yam, and uh, now, and um, I would say that maybe there's a half a dozen prisoners that are still alive, of mm -hmm. of the ones that I had taken out all the rest have died look they were all so badly tortured i have to tell you you can't even imagine what they did to them in the prisons in your wildest dreams you can i guess you can imagine but i had i saw it i saw their bodies i saw the the marks on the feet and the, what they did to the kids at the bottom of their feet oh my god it was terrible was terrible. The fella caught the beatings, the um, horrible, horrible, just horrible. And um, so those are the ones that I did keep in touch with. A few others, a few others. One, a woman who was shot in the back who's paralyzed is like a sister of mine now. She lives in Brooklyn. I love the woman and I love her kids. And she has a grandchild named Judy too. And um, But the rest of the people I didn't keep, I don't keep in touch with them. You know what? Get a life. I'm not part of it. You don't owe me anything. At one time they were, 
when I would meet them, because I had to in Israel, because I wanted to know how the escape went. If the smug, if it was a, a good smuggler, uh, an, an honorable smuggler, if there's such a thing. But um, I, um, I had to hear what happened. That was the only time I met them because I needed to know, can I use the smuggler again or can I use that route again? Because if it wasn't going to work, I was, if it was too hard, I wouldn't use it again. I'd have to come up with something better. Mm -hmm. is, 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 there, is there anybody else? Uh, can you do a couple, couple more quickies? For us, it's getting very late. David, anybody? Uh, anybody else? Ah, oh, Philip Morris. I saw him waving. Can you de can you demute yourself, Philip? Press the button. You don't know how to demute. Oh, How about that? You can you hear me now? Yes. No, we can. Yeah. No, we can. This, yeah. Judy, it's a very, very uplifting story. Uh, I can't tell you how uplifting it is uh, to hear of a an ordinary Yiddish woman who's done this and you know saved so many lives. It's, it's fantastic, especially as I'd never heard of it, heard of the story before. She's not. She's and, not an ordinary woman, Philip. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm a mummy who's going to make dinner now. But, but I mean, we, we heard, you must have heard about, about Nicholas Winton and the kinder transport. Oh, yes. Amazing man. And, you know, I've, I've been to um, been, been to Hungary and seen statues to him. And, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic, uplifting story. How would, I, I wondered how you would feel. I mean, you've had a book written about you, which I obviously I haven't haven't read, but obviously I read. But how would you feel if if someone made a movie about about this story? Because I found the whole thing so uplifting. Well, how would you feel about it? Um, there's an Israeli producer in Tel Aviv. Uh, right. It's not really Israeli. He's international. Um, that they're they're international in Switzerland, Mexico, and Tel Aviv. He, they do a tremendous amount of films um, on Netflix. Right. They want to do a fictionalized six-part series. Right. That's what. I was, yeah. A fictionalized though. Okay. And I did, and I have to tell you, I did sign the contract with them. Right. They have a year and a half to figure it out. Uh, we did interview. I did interviews with one of their uh, researchers. Right. But their problem is they have to get somebody to write a script. Yes. That is really, really difficult because, first of all, it's COVID. Second of all, they need somebody very very special who can get into to the soul of this story there's yes they're just talking here in an hour so i mean i haven't even told you stories of the people the what happened how they went out how they uh, how they how they were smuggled we didn't even discuss smuggling uh, borders taping the children's mouths with with uh, with uh, with heavy tape. Uh, it, these are such so many stories, so the kids wouldn't cry. Anyway, he had they haven't gotten yet a um, a uh, a writer that they want. They're still looking for the writer. Look, they they want to get somebody in Los Angeles, but you know they can't go from Tel Aviv to Los Angeles to sit down and have a talk with the writer that they're looking at. Everything is on Zoom, and it's not the same as sitting in front of you and seeing people's faces and hand motions and look in their eyes and and really 
see the nisham of these people. So whether they're going to be able to do it, I don't know. They have one. I told them they can do whatever they want with the story when they have it all, except one thing they cannot do. You cannot put me in bed with an Arab. And that, look, I was doing this in my 30s. I didn't have lines in the face. The hair was long. I wore the shmata with the, uh, I wore the burqa. I had the whole bit. But I said to him, you cannot put me in bed with an Arab. Other than that, do whatever you want. Fictionalize it the way you want. But that's one thing. And that's part of the contract. Because you can look for a lot of other things that you can fictionalize. Look, I don't know if any of you, maybe all of you watched the, the story of Ellie Cohn on Netflix. I mean, part of that is fictionalized. His wife didn't like part, part of it. I thought it was brilliant. And it was a very good series. And that's the kind of thing that they're looking to do if they can get if they can get the writers, and if I'm not too old, I mean, I'm getting old, they gotta hurry up and do this already. Mm -hmm. You know, they can do it without me because the uh, uh, I've done some interviews with them, but there's still a lot to go. And they need the writers, they need, uh, look, to do a six part series and to sell it to Netflix or one of the other media, it's not gonna, you know, it's gotta be a good piece before they buy it. But that's their, that's their problem. It's not mine, I'm not involved. So, but uh, thank you for asking. We'll see if it ever happens in my lifetime or your lifetime. <laughs> I, th I think I think we should really come to a close now. Um, I, I, I really I, I, I really don't know what to say to you, but the first, the first thing I, that I that I must say, I'm not sure you know them, but I wanted to thank the Zeepers, the lovely Zeepers from Toronto. I don't know, do you know them? And they 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 indirectly put this together. She's waving now. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you for one thing. Can I show you something? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, do you know what this is? No. Now look at the back. Yeah. That was smuggled out of a Syrian prison. That's how I knew. That's how I knew this man was out yeah. of the secret police prison and was put in Tel Maza. This was smuggled out. They made them do beating. And this, and I show you this because it's one of the great things that I own. Yeah. Oh. Who, 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 who did it for you? Ellie Swed. You know that you saw the younger brother? Yes. yes. That's in there? When yes. he was smuggled, he did this. Oh. Another man, another man, you see the pen? It's beaded. They torture the hell out of them. And when they set, then when they send them to a regular prison, regular, Elmaza or Wada, they give them beating work to do. And these are two pieces. I have the third piece, which was a um, another man made a, a pencil box beaded. I told him to keep it. I gave it to him back in Israel. And I said, this is what you will give your grandchildren. These two pieces I'm keeping. It's worth more than money, isn't it? Oh. Well, that's how I knew where they were. I knew which prison they were in by this, my underground smuggled bat. That's so that's how I knew they were no longer 50 feet below the ground. But uh, I, I mean, now I I'm not going to interrupt anymore. I'm sorry, you guys <laughs> all have to go to bed and I'm keeping you all night. No, no, no. As I said just before, you know, I wanted to thank the Zephyrs. Very, very good friends of mine, and they're 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 in Toronto, and and indirectly they were the ones that introduced me to you. You know the Zeepers? I'm not not sure where they live, in, but anyway, they're they're waving at you in a minute, so um, okay. I'm sure I'm sure you're related some somewhere along the line. So thank you very much, the Zeepers.
Um, and um, I, I, I don't know how many people um, in the world can achieve what you've achieved. It's it, it's just it's just it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So I, I can only I can only thank you for your time. Um, and I don't think many people that were here tonight. We had a nice, a very nice crowd. Um, I don't think many people are going to ever forget you because um, we've had a lot of people through 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 our, our evenings. Um, but this is something very, very, very unique. So I, I can't I can't say more than thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you for inviting me. It's very, very nice. My husband's from Leeds, so ah. I have a I have a. <laughs> And his sister still lives, lives in Leeds. Ah, uh, can you understand what he said? He says? grew up in Cheltenham, but he lived in Leeds and he was in the British Army after the war. Ah, uh, does he ever so, come, do you ever come to London? I, we used to. Yeah. We can't go anywhere. Can't go, well, that'll be over, not, not, another few months and we'll all, all be Oh, there. you think so, eh? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I not think some of the... Both we need the vaccine you. first. Yeah. Um, is David there? He's still open. David Lando? Hello? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still oh. here. No. So I've, I've tried to say goodbye, but I can't say goodbye. But, um, I'll leave it to you. Okay. Uh, Judy, thank you very much. Um, you. you are a remarkable lady. Uh, you've had a, um, a remarkable life, and thank you for sharing your story with us. It's uh, fascinating, amazing, wonderful to hear, uh, and you should be blessed all your days and beyond. Thank you, and I'm very honoured to speak to you all, and I wish you all a Chag Pesach, some Mayach, and good health, and we should all get through this horrible plague. Thank you, and hopefully yeah. in Canada you get the vaccine soon as well. <laughs> <laughs> Mount to God's ears. <laughs> we, we we try. If if we have any left, we'll send to you. Uh, please we're struggling. Send us. Please, <laughs> please send us some. We'll see. Um, and for everybody who's been here this evening, thank you for joining us. Um, next week, because it's Erev Pesach, um, we are taking a rest from Wednesday Night Live, uh, and we return during. Um, Chol Hamoid, when we have Rabbi Lister with us, so it will be myself, David Oliver, Rabbi Lister, otherwise known as the Three Davids. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. You'll hear a bit about his life, um, and um, it should be just a fun evening, um, local, but uh, anybody else, even from Canada, if you would like to join us that evening, or for you that afternoon, because we'll be back to five hours difference then, uh, as things change. Uh, I'd just like to wish uh, you, Judy, everybody else in Canada, everybody in Edgware and around a... A chag um, an enjoyable Pesach, and hopefully we are at some point in the very near future we can all be together and um, not having to worry about Zoom and social distancing. It will be so nice to be back together. Thank you. So, and thank you, everybody, again. Thank you, Judy. It's been an absolute thank pleasure. You. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you very much, Judy. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hello. Stop the live stream now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>